Uh, I want to make a shout out to Shantanu who recommended I create a video on TGN, uh, Temporal, uh, Grab Networks, and it was about time since Dynamic Networks is such an uh, interesting like uh, uh, concept, uh, uh, interesting research uh, direction, and many real-world applications such as social media networks uh, rely on uh, having the or modeling these uh, dynamic graphs. So what's a dynamic graph? So basically, whenever you have, so so in contrast with static graphs, basically here you have uh, the nodes can be added, deleted, uh, modified, same goes with edges. So we basically have two types of events. We have uh, node-wise events and we have interaction or edge events. So let's say we have some simple uh, network here, like graph, and uh, it can be multi-graph in, in the general case. And basically, uh, I'll be using Twitter as a running example since the authors of this paper Emanuele Rossi, uh, Ben, Fabrizio, uh, David, Federico, and Michael Bronstein are all from Twitter. Let's say Anna decides to join Twitter. So basically she signs up, she fills up this sign up form, and now she's a new node in, in Twitter, uh, social graph, and that's basically the node addition event. Now let's say uh, after a couple of days she was just kind of retweeting people, and every single retweet is basically an edge in that graph. Now, uh, Ben joins Twitter, and because those two broke up, Anna is pissed off, and she just deletes the Twitter account altogether, and that's the node deletion event. Now, Ben is also pissed off, and so he decides to update his uh, user profile, updates his, his description, and by updating the description, he's basically changing his feature vector. And you can think of it, maybe we take this text and we pass it in a BERT uh, encoder, and you basically have CLS here, token. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with BERT. If you're not, just treat it as a black box. We input the text here, we get out the uh, condensed representation here, and we use exactly this thing as the feature vector. So that's the node modification event. Now, after a couple of days of uh, activity, he decides to retweet Andrew Eng, uh, Eng's cool post, and basically now whatever the retweet text is, uh, that's the edge feature vector. And now maybe he made a typo, so he decides to to modify uh, the text, even though that's not possible on Twitter, but let's say it is, and for the sake of argument, and basically that's the edge modification event where now the new text is again uh, fed through BERT and we get the new feature vector. And finally, he decides to just delete the tweet altogether, and that's the node, uh, that's the edge deletion event. So that's how the dynamic graph works in a nutshell. It's basically a multi-graph because every single node can have multiple edges uh, between, uh, so the nodes, nodes are connected via multiple edges and that's, that's what's known as a multi-graph. Okay, that out of the way, let's uh, jump into the paper and uh, see what they say. So they say here a few approaches have been proposed for dealing with graphs that are dynamic in nature. So basically most of the research in graph ML was focusing on static graphs. Uh, and not on dynamic graphs. And uh, while it is possible to apply static graph deep learning models to dynamic graphs by ignoring the temporal evolution, this has shown been shown to be suboptimal. So what that means is the following. So you have this graph here, and basically every single edge has a timestamp attached to it. So let's say uh, Ben here has got uh, maybe three retweets of Andrew Eng, and this one happened at T1, this one happened at T2, this one happened just recently, like a couple of seconds ago at T3. And you can treat this as a static graph, just a static multigraph. Uh, or you can um, uh, kind of acknowledge the, 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 like the existence of these timestamps and use that to when you subsample your neighborhood later, and we'll see why we do that a bit later, but when we subsample the neighborhood, we can just take the most recent edges, and uh, by doing that, we, we, we have a much more optimal performance than ju just by treating this as a static graph and doing uniform, a uniform sampling of the neighborhood. So, yeah, basically that's suboptimal. You can treat it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a static graph, but it's suboptimal, okay? And, yeah, so... Uh, learning on dynamic graphs is relatively recent, and uh, most of the previous work was uh, focused on these discrete time dynamic graphs, uh, which is just a sequence of snapshots of the graph. So basically, uh, you, you, you you have your graph that's evolving, and what you do in, the, in this discrete uh, time dynamic graphs is the following. You just take a snapshot at equidistant moments. So maybe you, you had some graph at T1 that looked like this, and then... Uh, after some period, 
And the important part here is that this is pretty much the same constant. So you have equidistant moments when you take the snapshot and maybe a couple of more edges and nodes appeared, uh, etc. So like this, I don't know, whatever. And you do the same thing after the same time period t. This is basically the improvement over the static graph modeling, but this discrete time um, uh, dynamic graphs are still limited compared to the continuous ones that we're gonna see in this paper. Okay, a uh, small uh, recap, basically, when you want to compute the embeddings for the static graph, you, have, you just have basically accumulation over the neighborhood of uh, these messages, and H is just a trainable uh, update function, and that's how you get your embeddings. That's what this equation here stands for. Uh, but it's not so important now, so I just want to uh, kind of walk you through uh, some terminology that we'll be using, and that's, as I already mentioned, we have this discrete time dynamic graphs, uh, or DT, DTDGs for short, and we have continuous time dynamic graphs on the other hand, and those are the ones we'll be treating in this uh, video. And basically, uh, the, 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 the point here is we, we treat it as a, as a sequence of time-stamped events. So every single event, be it node-wise event, be it uh, the edge event, has a timestamp associated with it. Uh, contrast that with the static graphs where we had those equidistant snapshots. And I already explained uh, those two. And now the, 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 the interesting concept, new concept that's not encountered in static graphs is this uh, concept of a temporal neighborhood. So what it means basically is the following. So again, you have some nodes in the graph. And let's say um, there are multiple edges here. And let's say this one happened at T5. And we're currently uh, looking for some reason, we're looking at a, at a moment that happened bef prior to T5, like at T4. Uh, that basically means that the neighborhood of this graph here is, uh, will ignore this edge. So everything that comes after this particular target uh, uh, moment of time is ignored. And that's uh, what you're left with. So all of the other edges here is what's known as the temporal neighborhood of this particular node at this point of time. Okay, so that's a new concept. And with that out of the way, let's let's jump and see uh, what what are the main mo modules in in this TGN network. Okay, let me give you a, a quick uh, high level overview of the system, and then we'll slowly start building on and adding new details. So high level, how we train this. Uh, graph uh, neural network, this whole system actually, because it also has this thing called memory, uh, is the following. So we do a self-supervised uh, learning and we, we're learning how to predict link to do link prediction. So basically because we have, have all of the, all of those retweets and we have timestamps associated with them, we, we can just do chronological sort over all of those interactions and we can just uh, predict the, the interactions that have that haven't yet happened. And that's 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 basically the you just batch that chronologically sorted uh, array of, of those uh, edge interactions, and you just predict the follow-up uh, uh, edges. It's a similar thing as, as transformers. There you're trying to predict the follow-up word, and here you're trying to predict what the next interaction will be. So that's the high-level um, overview of how the thing works. So now let's see uh, on this chart what happens basically. So you have you have, and I'll I'll just create a simple example here. We have node one, we have nodes two, and we have node three. So one, as you can see here, at T1, one retweeted node two, and at T2, node two retweeted uh, node three. So like this. So uh, now what we do is the following. We have, so because uh, node one also had some other interactions, maybe that happened even prior to these interactions. So let's say these happened at whatever, T0 maybe, okay? So now what happens is that we have this embedding method and that's basically get. You, if, you, if you haven't watched my video uh, on graph attention networks, you can check it out, I'll link it somewhere here. And you basically do uh, one layer get over this uh, node one. Uh, over its temporal neighborhood, and we already mentioned what that is, we do get and we calculate the embeddings for nodes 1, 2, and node 3, right? And those are these Zs. Once we have those, we can just calculate the probability using a simple decoder. So they used MLP here, 
So you just concatenate these two embeddings, you just uh, pass them through a MLP, MLP, and you just add the nonlinear function like sigmoid uh, nonlinearity, and that means this is basically probability. And now, in order to train, you do the following. So uh, you want to make sure that P, uh, so given T1, uh, what's the probability of interaction between 1 and 2 happening? And we know it's 100%, it's 1, because it already happened, we have it in the data set, right? Uh, we did it a chronological sort. So you want to push, you want to push the loss uh, to go to one, to, p to go to one. Uh, I lo loss will be, be zero because we're just using simple uh, binary cross entropy here, and we'll also have negative edges, which will want to make sure that the probability goes to zero. And uh, yeah, that's it. So if you have maybe some nodes x and nodes y, and this interaction hasn't happened. We want to make sure that um, uh, we, we we push the the probability to zero for those for those uh, node pairs, okay? And we use a simple, as I mentioned, so loss is just a binary uh, cross entropy. Uh, that means that's a fancy name for you. You just put the log here. So basically, if we have positive examples, we'll just the loss will have a format like this minus log of p, right? And um, if I just draw it here. Uh, they will look like this and basically we want to push the probability to go to 1 because then the loss goes to 0. For when we have negative examples, we'll just have minus log of 1 minus p. And that will just kind of um, mirror this chart here and it will look like this. So we have p on the x-axis, we have loss on the y-axis and the loss will look like this. Basically, at zero, we have loss uh, that's uh, that's equal to zero, and at one, it goes to infinity. So uh, that's how we train it. Simple BC. We have positives, we have negatives, uh, we have the data set with, uh, and th we just batch it, and we use those batches to 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 um, to to predict uh, those 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 links because we know they're there. Okay. So how the embedder part works? So uh, get leverage is something called uh, memory or states in this TGN network. So what it is is basically every single node in our, gra in our graph, in Twitter graph, has has a, a state associated with it. So we have a huge table, and every single node in this table has some representation. And they said here basically the purpose is to represent the node's history in a compressed format, and that's exactly what it does. So basically, over the uh, when the interactions are happening in Twitter, we're basically using all of those to just update uh, this memory state, and then we can use those to later uh, do some recommendations, but I'll get to that in a moment, okay? So we have these states, and they are somehow calculated, so we have some messages, we do some aggregation, uh, we somehow use them to update uh, the, the, the memory state, and then the embedding method, the get, will just use those to uh, calculate the embeddings and we can predict the links. So that's that's the high level overview and now we'll slowly start digging into details. Hopefully it was clear enough. Um, maybe one more thing to worth mentioning. Um, when we are using get uh, in this in this model, uh, the way we we subsample the neighborhood is using the most recent edges. So that's why we have timestamps. So basically uh, if we have a bunch of edges we'll use, we'll only subsample the most recent K ones. So we, we sort the, the neighborhood edges by timestamps and we just take the K most recent ones that may be like 10 most recent neighbors and then you just do the simple get aggregation and we'll see what exact features go inside uh, here in a sec. Okay, now the problem with this uh, chart is, if you maybe, if you noticed, is that we are using uh, these interactions to calculate the messages, to update the states, and then we're using that inf th those states to predict the links. So that means we have information leakage here. We're basically using this information to update states, and then we're using the states to predict those links, and that doesn't make any sense, right? But because you somehow have to, uh, you somehow have to um, 
calculate and use these message functions to get the states because otherwise you won't have any gradients flowing towards these trainable functions. The aggregated messages and messages and this mem function, they are all trainable. So you somehow have to have uh, this forward pass here. But you can use this batch. You'll just use the previous batches and that's the solution. So basically they have a graph here, okay. Um, you have to introduce this concept of a uh, raw memory storage. And now what you do here is from the previous batch, you just stored all the necessary information inside here. So now when you try to predict the, the, the existence of a link between one and two, the, the, the existence of, of retweet uh, in, in the case of Twitter, uh, what you do is the following. You use the, 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 the last batch and I mean, not just the last batch, actually the whole history and you calculate the messages and we'll see how we do that. So we have some data here that's necessary to cal calculate these messages. Then we just aggregate the messages. So you see here that the messages for the uh, node two are kind of accumulated and then we update the states and they just use grew here and we'll see those details. So what happens is basically you, you, you have the previous state. So this is grew. G R U. You just use S2 and this is the old state, and you use the, the newest message, this M2 aggregated, and this will just spit out new state, and we just write it down here. So that's how, how we update the, the states. Now the states have, uh, now we have this thing like included in the computation graph, and we just uh, use get to calculate the embeddings, and to we get to the loss. So now gradient, gradients can now flow through the whole system and all of these functions, which we'll see what they exactly are. So these egg, these mem uh, functions will be uh, updated in the backpropagation step. Okay, so that's the important solution. So introduction of uh, raw message store is important because that allows us to train this part of the pipeline, this part here, okay? Okay, hopefully that was clear enough. Um, let me let me slowly start digging into into details of how the messages are, are computed, and then once we have all of those details, I'll, I'll again zoom out and try and explain uh, everything. Okay, so messages are computed the following: once interaction happens between nodes I and J, so we have node I, we have J, one of them retweeted the other, so we have interaction that happened, and it has fe feature vector associated with it, so that's E I J, right? So how we calculate the message is basically uh, we input the previous states and this t minus just means um, the state before this interaction happened for those nodes. Uh, so th that's basically whatever is currently in the state table. So we have SI here, we have SJ. So whatever is currently in there, we use those and we input them in the message function. And we additionally use the uh, this feature vector I just mentioned. So that's like the maybe BERT encoding of retweet. And we finally use this delta t, which is the time that has elapsed between the previous interaction and this current interaction. So that may be like 30 seconds or whatever. Uh, and that's how we compute the message for this, uh, for this node i. And then we do analogously to uh, node j. So that's the destination. So that's the source and destination nodes. And the only difference is these are permuted if you can notice here, so just permutation, simple permutation. And uh, although this can be trainable, what it did is they in practice use just identity function, which means they are just doing simple concatenations uh, between all of these features. So you have some vector here, vector, you concatenate all of them, and that's your message. And this here is an interesting thing, and I'll later explain uh, how we convert time to a vector, uh, to a vector representation, and just stay tuned for that. Okay. So that's the uh, so that's the part with with the messages, okay? And they said here a more complex message function that involves additional aggregation from the neighborhood uh, from the neighbors of nodes i and j is also possible and is left for future study. So the thing with this paper is there is there is a it's a it's a work in progress. There is a lot of things they still want to try and they haven't tried it. So uh, for example, they have this uh, node-wise uh, memory. Uh, but they also, so they say it here, while a global graph-wise memory can also be added to the model to track the evolution of the entire network, we'll leave this as a future work. So that's that's my point. Uh, there is uh, still a lot of things uh, that, that evolving in this work. So yeah, just, just keep that in mind. Um, okay, so once we have the message function, so that's this part, right? 
so that's the messages how do we aggregate them and here we just have a message aggregator and again it can be a trainable function but what they did is they just do a simple most recent message and mean message heuristic and you can even see it here so what it did is you have m2 at t1 you have m2 at t2 they just took the last message and that's the aggregation okay um, in more general, general case they can also just do a mean or something else kind of do make it trainable uh, maybe p pass it through an rnn or whatever okay but it's stuck with the most recent message and let's use that as the running uh, example uh, finally we have the memory updater I already explained that they used some form you can use whatever like RNN the, uh, or LSTM they used a GRU which is a specific type of of LSTM basically and I already explained how it works but let me just repeat okay let's this is GRU and we have we have the state state I T minus we just get the new message and we just run this and there are like a if you know how if you don't know how Groove works I'll just link uh, Chris Ola's blog he has a really nice blog intuitive to understand how this works basically a bunch of forget and update gates and this spits out we can treat it as a black box for now it just spits out the new state si at point t so this was at t minus and here we have the current state so that's the memory updating part okay finally uh, we have the embedding module uh, and uh, so I haven't mentioned this but the main goal of the embedding module is to avoid the so-called memory staleness problem so what that means is the following so let's say we we have a graph and um, like we have we had Ben here and maybe Ben stopped uh, using Twitter for maybe a month or two and now what happens is that his if you take a look at the memory so and we we take Ben's state uh, because he's not interacting with anybody anymore. Uh, we this this representation is not updated, and so um, we 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 need to have uh, some sort of, of of embedding to 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 make this relevant uh, for Ben when he returns. So if we want to recommend to Ben which tweets sh should he uh, see, so that's like your your homepage on Twitter, you see a bunch of tweets. So Twitter somehow needs to figure out which tweets are relevant for you, and also uh, Twitter should recommend you uh, what's the what's what what are the persons you should probably follow. So how they do that is the following. So Ben has. Uh, his state B and in the simplest case you could just do the following you could just take SB and maybe Andrew Ang has his own state as A and you just do a dot product or MLP and uh, whatever and that spits out some probability so if the probability is close to one uh, Twitter may recommend that you follow uh, uh, Andrew Ang okay but now the problem is if this remains stale these predictions will not be as relevant anymore for Ben because he he has changed in the meanwhile okay so the solution is to use what I already explained and that's using some kind of a, like a GNN module a like get and uh, you you get the updated version uh, of the of the embedding because his friends presumably uh, pres presumably his friends haven't uh, stopped using Twitter so their states are are being constantly being updated so we can use the the top so, so we can use that information to make a more relevant predictions for Ben okay hopefully that makes sense and um, they had a couple of baselines so the, the one I mentioned the, the simplest one is just to take the you just take the state uh, of, of the user so that's this uh, identity uh, embedding so the final embedding is just whatever the state is and they show that this has a really bad performance on, on the later benchmarks okay and uh, then we have this time projections simple equation you can check it out yourself uh, I'll focus on 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 the uh, temporal graph attention so this is the important part this is the strongest baseline basically they had uh, and the way it works it's it's the same thing as get uh, just instead of using uh, uh, the the attention uh, that get used originally, they just use the original Vasvani uh, attention. So that means they have uh, queries, keys, and values, and everything else remains the same. Um, basically, the new information here is uh, this five function, and the fact they're using multiple features concatenated here to get the final 
uh, embedding representation, okay? So let's see how it exactly works. So this H, so for a particular node at a particular time T, how they calculate the H is like this. So they, they take the state of that node at a particular time T, and they take the node's features. So that's basically maybe a description on your profile and then birth embedding, blah, 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 blah. And you basically just add them up and that's your zeroth, zeroth, that's the row, that, th those are the raw features, okay? So we concatenate those with the uh, basically edge information. So let me, let me draw an uh, example here, it'll be easier. We have a node, we have a bunch of nodes here. Again, we'll do the most recent uh, neighbors, we'll just uh, kind of dis disregard all of the others. So let's say we only take these two into account, okay? So we'll, these are these will have some um, these will have some features. So if this is node one, uh, this is maybe node i. So this is uh, node i one, and this is node uh, i j. Sorry, j j one. And uh, so you you just combine those information and you combine with phi. So what's what's phi exactly here? And uh, it's a there is a this nice paper called um, Time to Weck. Time to Weck, and you can check it out. Uh, but basically, so that's one thing you could do. And uh, basically, what you do is in order to get the vectorized representation of time, you just map it into the following thing. So you map it into a vector that has uh, features like this. So maybe uh, w1t plus uh, n1. And then the second feature will be sine of w2t plus n2, etc. So you just continue using signs here and you increment uh, the arguments by one. So we have w3, etc. So uh, these are learnable. So you learn w2, n2, w1, n1, etc. Uh, and if, if you take a closer look and you're familiar with the transformer, this kind of resembles the positional encodings, except that these are uh, time aware, okay? And basically, so you learn these and uh, they showed in the time to work paper that you basically, uh, these are capturing the pre pre periodicity in the signal, whereas this one is uh, capturing something more uh, constant in the signal. So this one, if you take a look, this is just a simple, uh, basically, uh, a line. And these here are si sinusoids. So you basically are learning sinusoids like this, and the, the higher the W, the, the higher the frequency will be. And if you have some smaller W, then you'll have slower, smaller frequency, etc. And these are just uh, the offset, uh, these are just uh, encoding the offset of your sinusoids. So that's the simple uh, heuristic they use to encode the time. And once you have that, you just do simple multi-head attention, and you, you get the aggregated uh, feature vector, you concatenate it with the current feature vector and you pass it through an MLP. So this thing here, HI, corresponds to this node. And the second term here is the aggregated uh, combination of these two, because they are the most recent neighbors, right? So we kind of associate some alphas, alpha 1, alpha 2 here, and uh, we combine them like a simple weighted uh, sum and we get the features. So that's how we calculate the embedding. And they show that graph attention uh, network is the best baseline, we'll, we'll see that in a minute. So that was, that was all the nitty gritty details. Um, we saw how to train these, uh, uh, how, to, how, to pass, how to pass some gradient information to these modules. We saw how they exactly work and now we'll see a couple more details and then I'll zoom out. Um, I already mentioned this part about the information leakage and so I'll skip it. And so that's the reason we had to introduce the raw memory storage. And this part is interesting. So while from the perspective of the first interaction in the batch, the memory is up to date since it contains information about all previous interactions in the graph, from the perspective of the last interaction in the batch, the same memory is out of date since it lacks information about previous interactions in, in the same batch. 
this disincentivizes the use of a big batch size. So let me break it down for you. Um, that means the following. So we have the previous batch information. We update the states. And now this first, because this is a batch that's chronologically sorted, we have T5, T6. So this first interaction will be using states which are totally up to date. But once this one is done, we should basically have S1 and S2 updated because once an interaction happens, we calculate the messages for the nodes that, that are uh, associated with that interaction and we update the states. But we can do that while we are in the batch. So that means this, two, this one here, 2 to 3, will use the same state as this one here. And that means it's slightly out of date. And now imagine the bigger batch and they use 200 as a, as a nice trade-off. And the, 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 the deeper you are in the batch, let's call it that way, uh, the, the, more, the more stale this current um, state representation is. So that's the reason you don't want to have a too big of a batch, but then again, you don't want to keep it too, slow, too small because otherwise it will be really compute inefficient to have a small batch size, okay? So that's that part. And uh, now let me just show you the results before, before uh, I do a high level overview. So um, they, they had some uh, uh, continuous uh, disc dynamic graph uh, baselines here, like Jody, TGAD, which is basically the same thing as T, uh, like this, this paper, TGN. Uh, it just doesn't have memory and the associated modules. So it's a simplification of this, of this paper, basically. It's a specific case, specific instance. And they also uh, experimented with different, uh, uh, basically different embedding methods, using memory or not using memory module, etc. So they have a bun bunch of baselines. And the results are the following. So the uh, TGM with attention achieves the best results overall on all of the three data sets. So I was continuously using Twitter as a running uh, example, but they also have Wikipedia and Reddit, where this one is just uh, users are notes and pages are notes and user editing a page is an interaction event. And basically the edit text is what the feature for the edges, et cetera, okay? Similarly for Reddit. So it's, those are bipartite graphs. So we have, have pages here, we have users here. And let me see what's else interesting. They also did uh, node-wise classification, but that's not so, so important for this paper. And um, here are some ablation studies. Basically, you can see that, let me just zoom in a little bit. Uh, basically, the, the TGN with attention is the best trade-off overall because it takes uh, less time than these two. Uh, whereas the performance is really similar. So this one just uses two get layers. And the reason one get layer uh, is enough is because they are using this memory thing. And the memory thing already implicitly contains information from the neighboring nodes. So using one layer, you're basically, uh, uh, you're basically accessing the features from the two hop neighborhood, okay? And uh, using mean, I think the mean just means um, uh, they are using for the, for the memory aggregation, they are using the, the mean instead of the last, uh, last heuristic. And you can see TGET and Jody and DIREP, these other baselines are way lower uh, performance-wise than, than this method. Uh, some ablations, again, uh, with their own model, uh, where they don't use the memory, you can see the, the worst curve is here. Uh, when they uh, add two layers, again, no memory, it's a bit better. And then as we add the memory and we add the, 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 the last uh, message, um, aggregation heuristic, we get the best results overall. So that's pretty much it. Let me see if there is something else left. That, that's it. Um, now let me just, now with all the, the information you have in your head, let me just briefly go ahead and explain it again. Um, okay, now that we have all of the information um, explained, let me just kind of give you a holistic overview of the whole pipeline. So here we have the information from the previous batches. Uh, of these uh, edge interactions, okay? And that means we have, um, so RM1 is basically SI contains SI, SJ contains the delta T, so the, the time that elapsed between the previous interaction and this interaction, and we have EIJ, which is the, no, the interaction features. And we have the same tuples for all of the others. Um, 
the thing is we only focus on the nodes that we need. So this thing may be huge and contain information for, for many other nodes in our graph. We only care about nodes 1, 2, and 3. And that's why we only calculate those messages. So we have we, we just basically do a concatenation, that's what I did, and you get M1. You do a concatenation, you, d you get M2, etc. at different timestamps, okay? Now the aggregation, they used either the mean or the last message. So basically, you just take, let's say we, we use the last message, we just pass this message into the next step, and that's the aggregated messages array. Once we have those, we just have GRU here, and for every one of those, we pass the state, we have feed in the message, we, we spit out the new state when we update the states. So now we have the states and the, the this part is included in, into the computational graph. Now we use those states uh, and we use get to create the embeddings. Now interesting he thing here to note is, uh, so we have nodes 1, 2 and 3, but because uh, this node 1 maybe has some other uh, neighbors, uh, it, it will make sense. It would make sense to have other states here as well. So whatever the neighbors are, I'll call them S N. So those are these these guys here. Uh, it would be useful to have uh, the states for them updated as well, because those will be included via get because get uh, accumulates the neighborhood information, right? So those will be accumulated by the get. So I, I guess they just missed to to place S N here like the neighbors. Uh, but whatever. And finally, you calculate the embeddings, and now you just, uh, depending on the ground truth, so these exist, but the negative the negative ones don't exist, so you just use binary cross entry loss to train this whole pipeline end-to-end, -end, and now you have a system that can successfully predict uh, given two nodes, given two, yeah, given two nodes, you can calculate their embeddings, and you can predict whether they are likely to interact in the future. And that's useful for Twitter because you can use that to recommend um, for node A which node should th that node follow in the future, like maybe Andrew Ng or uh, which which uh, tweets should that user see, etc. A couple of strange things I've noticed in the paper, maybe maybe a typo or something. Uh, basically, uh, if you take a look at the query. Uh, it doesn't have the edge information here. So that means if you're doing a scale dot, uh, dot product between the, the, the query and the keys, you have a, like a different uh, dimension vectors, so you can't do it. So they, it's either a typo or they have some additional projection layer here that they didn't explicitly uh, include here or I, I've missed something. Uh, the second thing is I mentioned the memory staleness problem, but basically, uh, if it's like they are implicitly stating that you need to retweet somebody else in order for your memory state to get updated. But what if somebody retweets my post? So I assume because that interaction involves my node and that person's node, so because the way how the messages are computed, uh, my node's state should be updated as well. So I'm not sure um, uh, whether they're just simplifying it here in the paper. But anyways, uh, just, just keep that in mind that uh, that's not super clear uh, because for me it looks like that my state should be updated even though I'm, I'm not active on Twitter because other people are interacting with me and thus my memory state is being updated constantly. Uh, they're probably using a directed edge assumption here but it's not super clear from the paper. Uh, one more thing to keep in mind is that this memory uh, table is not, uh, let me open a pen, is not trainable. So what is trainable is the GRU here, the LSTM, and uh, potentially the message and aggregation functions, even though they just use the concatenation, so there's no learnable, learnable parameters here, uh, neither there is uh, learnable parameters in their aggregation function. So they're left up with learning mem. So that means once the, the, the model is fully trained, uh, you're basically, once an inter interaction happens, you just calculate the messages and you basically uh, aggregate them and you update the states. And um, that's it. And once you once you want to predict, uh, do some recommendation, then you use the um, uh, the get module and uh, create those embeddings and just uh, make the recommendation. So that was all I had to say for this video. Uh, you know the drill. Subscribe, hit the bell icon, and until next time, keep learning deep.